Hey guys, welcome back to the channel, best place for long-term store investors. Now, this video is going to be more educational for you guys. And these are the four financial metrics that we rarely use and why. Now guys, as usual, none of what we say should be construed as financial advice. What we say is purely educational. Hey guys, before we begin, just to let you know, we have a totally free masterclass just for you to sign up for in the comment section or the description where we will guide you on how you can build a six to seven figure portfolio using the power of stock investing. Go check it out. Okay, number one, Jonathan, a net profit. Please tell Kermit why. <laughs> yeah, okay. So why is net profit? Uh, actually, there's disclaimer also. This is a little bit of like a click, uh, like yeah. a click, click con set content. So why? I'll explain it in the next slide. Okay, so number one is that uh, the numbers that you see on the income statement, right? Actually, it is not really purely cash means at the bottom line after they sell the sales and the cost, deducting all of the costs. It's actually uh, what we what they actually practice is the accrual accounting. Mm -hmm. So that means is that there is some revenue is actually uh, gonna be registered under an invoice instead of just pure cash. Mm. It won't be transacted purely, like 100% of the money, sorry, of the profit will be go into your bank. Yeah. Yeah, so that's one thing is that the accounting difference. Uh. It's an accounting profit, not a cash or economic profit. Yes, correct. Right. So that is the number one thing why we really use net profit. And the two is that uh, tax benefit. Mm. Cause you never know that, uh, I think if you study a lot of these uh, tech companies, right? They get this thing called the pioneer status. So what does this pioneer status is that they actually, uh, uh, they actually reward those tech companies to not really pay that a huge amount of the yep, tax. Usually it's five plus five five years, so yes, it's 10 years. Correct. And actually that actually wipes out about like 80 to even 90% of the tax expenses they need to pay. Mm. Yeah, that's actually pretty, uh, very attractive to, yeah. for companies like uh, who are in the tax space. And this type of uh, pioneer status, right, does not really, uh, not, not all countries does practice this kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, it's only like uh, some countries like Malaysia, I, I'm not sure there's some other uh, countries that actually do practice this, but uh, from my study from some of the US companies, they don't really do that. Right. Yeah, so that, that is some advantage for all of these companies when you, if you, let's say you use the net profit to compare with different uh, yeah. companies. Yeah, okay. there'll be huge distinct, uh, difference. So, so it can be inflated, yes. Yeah. So this one has to do with either ones of earnings, right? Yes, correct, think? correct, yeah. So ones of earnings is that you don't see, uh, so for example, if let's say you see the revenue, actually they are making about 100 million, but suddenly their net profit, they are making about 150 million. Yeah. So that's like, how did they even make an, an extra 50 million after deducting of the cost, right? So yeah, that is come from the uh, once off game. You may want to like check out whether is it coming from the other income statements, uh, sorry, other income segment, which is at the bottom line of the gross profit. Uh, yeah, and just to be aware lah, that that kind of profit is not sustainable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of they sell certain assets or maybe like like COVID in a way, yep. was an inflated assets for let's say inflated situation for growth companies. Yes. Right? So once off, that rarely happens. Yes, correct. Okay. okay, number two, dividend you. Okay, this is a juicy yeah. one. I know a lot of people love dividend investors. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, this, yeah. Right? All right, guys, if you didn't know, we have a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program where you can apply for, where we level up your stock investing based on tailor-made solutions. If you're interested, you need to apply. Not of all of you all will get into an interview. It's only 20% of you all will do it and even fewer will get to hop on the program. But if you're confident that you can qualify, you can click on the link and fill in your details in the comment section or the description. Okay, so let's look at the dividend you, Jonathan. And this is the formula? Yes, correct. So if you look at the right-hand side, dividend use formula is basically the dividend for the period. You divide it by your share price of that particular company at that right. point of time. So why I actually, uh, personally, I don't really like to use dividend use is that uh, they, the formula itself, they, it includes share price. Right. That means that it follows the share price movement of that particular company and right. it's very hard to predict. Yep. Yeah, and that is actually one of the turn off already for me because you cannot even predict what will happen to that share price. So for example, like Serba Dynamic. 
So initially, Serba Dynamics uh, dividend yield, I believe, is around like three percent or maybe even four percent before it before all of the scandal and everything yes. But after the scandal had actually happened, their share price dropped so massively. Yes. So the dividend you have gone up a lot, right? Yeah. So their dividend is actually double digit, around like thirteen to even fourteen percent. So is that attractive to you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is the main question, right? Yeah. If you are looking purely on dividend you, yeah. So that is some uh, I would say like a trap lah, that you right. need to like be aware of. Yeah. And the second thing is that. This you don't really show you the payout consistency uh, of uh, uh, whether the c- company is able to actually yeah. pay out dividends. It could be inflated, a, right? Just yes, like. also, and it could be also like a one-off, like for example, yeah. a special dividend or whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, it's not. It doesn't really show the consistency of the company's ability to pay out dividends to shareholder. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true, true. And I think one more thing that people need to take note of is that the dividend is backward looking. Mm. So like. Of course, you talked about price just now. Yeah. But the dividends is for the period, typically a year, right? Yes. Or four quarters rolling. And um, that is based on what the economic conditions of the company was like in the past year or two. That's mm. why they're able to pay out that dividends. You as an investor need to figure out what's happening in the next one to two years at least. Yes. And that was essentially Saba Dynamics case. Yeah. Because if you look based on the numbers, it's attractive. But if you look in the forward, Mm. Not so attractive. Actually, thanks for uh, bringing this out because remember, Talk Glove actually recently just announced a dividend pay cut. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Classic so, case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you've been a Talk Glove investor, you know that they have always been paying out dividends, but exactly. recently they d- decided to stop because they don't have the ability to pay. Right. Right. And yeah, actually, the last bit is basically it shows you zero direction of the particular company yeah, exactly. because it's uh, lagging in the kinder. Yeah. So, the next one we'll talk about ROE. This is also a pretty controversial one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it, for those who don't know what is ROE is basically the returns on uh, equity lah. Yep, and yep. We'll sh- I will share with you why I rarely use this indicator. If you're enjoying the video so far, remember to like, comment, subscribe, click on the notification bell so that whenever new videos pop, you know it fresh. All right, guys. So next one is return on equities. This is the formula net income divided by shareholders equity. Now, it can be manipulated. So similarly, like the net profit. Right? Yes. So I don't think we need to explain much further that. Yeah. Right. And actually not only the net profit, but the cash also itself. Yeah. Because you never know whether the cash is it. Uh, sometimes they even raise like mm. private placement and all those stuff. That's true. Uh, that's or, true. Or sometimes they even cancel the cash, like so that it looks like the shareholders' equity is like less. Mm. So when it's less, ROE will be much more attractive. Much higher. Yeah, they yeah, can yeah. manipulate like that, lah. Yeah. So yeah, and another thing you need to know is that what if the earnings is a negative? Okay. So okay. this means that does that mean that this company you cannot invest already because their ROE is negative? I believe not so because maybe they are facing like a once-off event that uh, hinder their business. But who knows, maybe in the future, uh, it may be profitable. Yeah. yeah, you never know, right? So if it's negative, uh, ultimately this ratio study become like, it's useless already. Yeah, yeah and also them. I think a case study I always remember is Padini. Now, I'm not sure if they were in 2011, their earnings was affected or not, but I know their cash flow was affected mm. and it was actually negative. So if you, so for those of you who don't know, you, you can be creative about the ROE, you can actually replace net income with uh, cash flow. Yeah. Uh, but for uh, Padini, they actually had a negative cash flow. Mm. So their R- ROE, if calculated that way, would have been negative. So mm. doesn't mean it was bad. Well, what was actually happening with Padini was that they were actually acquiring a lot of cotton because the cotton's prices dropped a lot. And so they acquired and locked in their low costs for future earnings, right? So when they sell in the future, you know, the margin is in theory bigger. Mm. So when you know that, you won't say, well, it's a bad decision. Right, you'd be like, it's a good decision, and who cares about these accounting figures? Let it look right. back. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. And the next one, and the last one, actually, will be price to book. This one was very, very, very bad. Uh, yeah. This one, a lot of people like see this as a holy grail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Actually, I still, to this day, I still don't yeah. get why people use price to book. Uh. Yeah. yeah. And we find out why. And so, what is the big reason for you? Okay, so uh, before we go to the reason, for those who don't know, the price to book formula is basically your share price divided by the book value of the particular company. If you don't know what is book value, it's basically your uh, net tangible assets. Yeah, NTA, la, I believe you heard this term a lot also. So number one reason why we rarely use is that it is only applicable to asset-heavy companies. Yes. So uh, for example, like companies like, I believe, uh, real estate, mm. uh, 
still got what company that is used. Uh, basically, companies that use a lot of assets. Uh, you, if you cannot use this uh, ratio and it's, you cannot apply this to a tech company that has a very little asset, very light yeah, asset. Yeah. So for example, like Facebook or even Google, how are you going to use PB to actually determine whether they are yeah. undervalued or overvalued? The value is, uh, a lot of it is invisible and qualitative, right? Correct. I will actually expand on this point, right? Uh, it's actually more applicable to asset-heavy companies where a lot of their assets are liquid. Yes. So let's say like real estate or these companies with machinery sell that. Yeah, in theory, their, their book value is higher than the price and whatnot, right? The market cap. But if a lot of them are in illiquid assets, right? So like land and all that, right? Where they can't sell it easily, mm. is the money actually there? If you think about it, right? Correct. If a lot of it is just cash or some inventories and whatnot, uh, you know, the company is uh, actually pretty liquid and they might pay out a dividend. They might, uh, you know, take that money to reinvest for future opportunities. So that makes it a, makes price to be a little bit more relevant. Mm. But by and large, things are typically cheap for a reason. There's a reason why companies are below book values because the market don't think that the company is good. Yep. And so your job as an investor is to figure out whether or not the market is right. And I would say probably seven to eight out of 10 times the market is right. There are certain times where they are wrong. Mm. Yeah, uh, this one, uh, just like I pointed yep. it out, they, they ignore intangible assets, which may be a very, yep. which play play yep. a major role yep. for the company. Whether it's your distribution network, your sales force, yeah. your or, people. Or even like brand names, brand like names. Apple. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So that's huge, that's huge. And the last bit, uh, not really last bit, actually, the third point is basically they ignore earnings capability. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, sure you have assets, but are they really a productive asset that is mm. generating for you cash flow? Mm. Or are they a liability? Just ask yeah. property investors who have very nice house, but then cannot rent out. Yeah, like mention. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> like a mention. Go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the fourth point is that uh, what happens if the company has a very high debt levels? Because mm. the formula for book value is that you take your total asset and then you minus off your intangible asset and you minus off your liability. Correct. So, correct. but what if the company actually does take on a lot of debt, but let's say those debt are very, attract, very attractive kind of debt. That is good. I, yeah. I mean, that's, let's say their interest rate is only 1%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it is good for the company, but on paper or in the balance sheet, it looks really bad. So that actually can be like a double-edged sword again. Like, uh, like, price to book value don't really actually 100% show you whether the company is really uh, at a bad shape or even at a good shape. Absolutely. Yeah. So just to summarize, yep. right? These are the four net profit, uh, dividend yield, ROA price to book. Now, not all metrics are useful, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, of course, I don't think there's a useless metric in this world. It's just metrics that tell you less or more. Yeah, uh, actually this point is basically to highlight that you need to use the relevant metric Yes. Uh, for a particular company. Because all companies are different. Yes. Yeah, you just need to use the one that is right for exactly. that particular one. And the second bit is basically don't ever abuse all of this. Like for example, price to book, don't use price to book to every single different, yeah. uh, to all, this, uh, all of the different industries. Uh, that is the one. Second major point that you need to know. And the third thing is that you need to always compare with your peers because uh, you cannot really like compare within just only one company because that doesn't really tell you anything. Yeah, you need to see whether it's the competitors, uh, those clients, for example, like price to book, right? You want to compare between both price to uh, both competitors, price to book, whether is it an, really an other value state or it's an over value state. Fair enough, yeah. Fair enough. So that's about it for the takeaway. All right, guys. Hope yeah. you found this useful, this video useful and educational. Uh, let us know, right? If you have other ratios that you think that you don't really use, but maybe a lot of people really use them. Love to know it in the comment section. And guys, uh, see you in the next video. Come check out our other videos as well, by the way.